Hi guys, it is a gloomy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here on St. Patty's Day, Tuesday, March 17, 2020. Not many parades going on on the planet today, to put it mildly. This is Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles, guys, and we are launching into this special series on coronavirus. And guys, we are going to dive right into this. This man... We're going to kick off this series with this man, the very first interview I ever had on Collapse Chronicles. And this is a man who needs no introduction on this channel. And this is Professor Paul Ehrlich. Uh, so, Paul, that's all the introduction you need, brother. Uh, come on and say hi to the folks, and we're going to dive right into uh, this conversation about coronavirus. It should take about 15, 20 minutes. Well, this is the only time that I've actually done a podcast or anything like it when I'm locked down. Uh, and so I'm locked down now uh, you... in a uh, building filled with people in retirement. Uh, we have a uh, at least one case in the building diagnosed. But since we're in the hands of total morons, uh, uh, we don't know what's going on. In other words, you don't have any of the data we really need uh, to uh, deal with this horrendous situation. And that's largely because uh, we have uh, a Republican president who is not just a liar and a sexual predator and so on, but also an idiot. And the, the uh, Senate is the same way because they're in control of the, uh, uh, of the Republicans. And uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. Trump did was closed down the part of the White House that was set up by Obama to deal with things like pandemics. And if we'd had sensible people there, then we would have done what we haven't done yet, and that is locked down the entire country. Uh, and uh, as a result, I think probably everybody listening knows what's going on, or at least knows what you can know about what's going on, because we're so far behind the curve, we don't really know in detail. Uh, what's going to happen, although we know, of course, in broad, uh, in broad terms. So are you on voluntary or involuntary lockdown, Pa? Uh, well, it's not been totally clear. There's six. We're in the Bay Area near San Francisco. There are six um, counties which have been told to shelter in place. And uh, I can move around my own building if I want to, although we have, again, uh, at least one confirmed case here. Again, we don't have the testing that should have been set up months ago now uh, to know what's going on. I can go out and walk as long as I uh, uh, am not within six foot uh, of somebody walking with me. Uh, if, however, four or five of us got together on the sidewalk, at least in theory, uh, the police can disperse us. Or if we refuse to disperse, in theory, uh, they could uh, uh, fine or imprison us. Is that a good thing or a bad thing, in your opinion? Oh, I, I would lock down. If I had the power, I would lock down the entire country right now. I wouldn't wait. The, there's a moron who's, president, who's governor of Oklahoma who still says it's okay to go out and hug and kiss and so on. I, it sounds to me like somebody has whispered in the president's ear uh, that he's an idiot and should change his behavior, and apparently there is some sign that he is. But of course, it's three months too late now, uh, and uh, we're going to see, unless everybody who has any knowledge of epidemiology is totally confused, it's going to get a lot worse in the United States. And uh, in my view, you cannot take too many precautions at the moment because there's too much uncertainty. Maybe. Uh, some of us are being paranoid, but us paranoids also have real enemies. And uh, if you look at what's happened in Italy, for example, uh, you know what's coming in the United States. I was told this morning by a scientist colleague uh, who's very high placed in the scientific community that uh, there is at least one uh, hospital in the Boston area, or at least in the Northeast, in where the emergency room is being clogged uh, with people who are young, uh, which means the virus may have mutated. It may be a pure statistical accident. 
Nobody knows because there's no, to this day, there is no top level federal government coordination of what we should be doing on the messaging so we can have some idea what's actually going on and so on. Almost all of what I say to you is based on a mob of scientists who uh, don't have enough data to be sure of what's happening. So all we can do is say, be very, very cautious because we have enough information to know that great caution is called for. Oh, okay, so so Paul, I uh, would, would, would love to go, to go down this, this end of the conversation, but we are very limited. I know you're busy and you can imagine what it is in my life. So I have gone kind of out a little bit out of character and have actually created a list of eight specific questions. Uh, would you be willing for me to, to go, 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 go down my list? and Go down your list and I'll try and give you snappy answers. Okay, so since this is Collapse Chronicles and what we talk about here is the it, we look more from a society-wide angle about things that can lead to the collapse of global industrial civilization and whatnot. So I want to steer a little bit away from the direct human health impacts to the impacts on society. So the overriding question before I break this down, is coronavirus on any level the trigger for the collapse of global industrial civilization and why or why not, Paul Ehrlich? Well, uh, we don't know whether it is. We know that, or at least I am convinced and my close colleagues are all convinced that uh, in the next couple of decades, we have entrained a collapse of industrial civilization. And this is exactly the sort of thing one would expect if the collapse is actually starting. Uh, but of course, how fast it collapses, one, one of the weird things is that everybody got focused on on Trump as a moron and that for, as it dis, distracted us from the issue that industrial civilization is going down the drain anyway. In other words, uh, well, I was <clears throat> I have a bad voice and that's because I spent three weeks in Sydney, Australia, where we have very close friends during the fires. Uh, that's one of the signs of the collapse of industrial civilization. Uh, in the short term, uh, if, the, uh, if the virus causes a close down of much of industry, it may slow the collapse. For example, the air in some parts of China has become breathable again when they shut down their factories. Uh, so the answer is, it could be the start. I, I think we're already in the beginning of the collapse of industrial civilization and it and Trump are just symptoms. Uh, but it could trigger it faster because, uh, of course, we're not at all prepared. Yeah. So when do you think we will know whether it's the trigger or not? Uh, next week or six months from now? I, let's put it this way. We'll know a lot more six months from now if we're still around. I don't know if I'll know anymore because, of course, I'm in the extremely vulnerable category. How old are you now, Paul? Do you mind sharing that with us? Almost 88. Eight, good Lord, going on 88 years old, and we do we do appreciate. But again, I have heart disease and a lot of other problems, so you know I'm a real target. Well, you're. Uh, I have had one 88 year old on. Was I was the last person to ever interview them? Then they, then apparently right after they talked to me, they killed over and died. So uh, hopefully this will not be the last interview with Paul Ehrlich and. That was I, that was I, Wally Broker, uh, the climatologist Wally Broker. I I think I killed Wally, but oh, it, it, anyway, uh, <laughs> question. I, this, I, I at least going to survive long enough to get to the <laughs> wine bottle. <laughs> question number two. So where would you place the threat of coronavirus on? the present list of threats against civilization at the top, at the bottom, somewhere in the middle? I would put it somewhere in the middle because uh, I've been screaming about our lack of preparation for this for now for more than 50 years. 
uh, and nobody's paid any attention. I shouldn't say nobody. Lots of other people have been screaming, too. The Obama administration started to pay some attention to it because they had a brilliant science advisor who pushed hard on uh, these issues. Uh, but I put it around the middle. I would say the single most dangerous thing at the moment, of course, is our refusing of the nuclear triad, uh, making the Russians extremely nervous. And, of course, we have... Uh, around the world, some people with nuclear weapons who are out of their minds. Uh, I would put then uh, the collapse of biodiversity and climate change, which are closely tied together. Climate disruption has already let Australia almost burn to the ground, and that's going to get much worse. Uh, the pandemic has the advantage that if it's like most pandemics, it won't kill everybody or destroy the infrastructure. Uh, so that it is at least if the collapse is caused by pandemics, which it may well be, uh, it's possible that electricity, computers and so on will persist in some areas so that civilization might have a chance for a reset. Uh, but with there, and that's what most of my colleagues are concerned with, what will the reset look like? Will we just go back to the same insane growth mania which has taken us down the drain now okay so uh again any one of these we could uh we could spend an hour on each one of these questions but we don't have an hour do you consider the direct threat to human health or the knock-on effects to the global economy from coronavirus to be the bigger threat to civilization itself at this point? Well, unhappily, we don't know enough about the virus to be sure, but my guess would be the second, namely that it will be the knock-on effects that'll be, that'll, from a global point of view, not from an individual point of view, will be the most serious. Uh, I, it would be a lot better if we knew more about the virus as Josh Lederberg, the uh, uh, now gone Nobel laureate in this area, uh, discussing viruses, said something like, the survival of humanity is not preordained. It is possible to get a virus that will end up killing everybody. Do you think this one is the one, or do you think there's a bigger one? No, I don't think this one is the one, but uh, it is mutating, and we don't know what directions it's going to go. Uh, you'd have to ask Josh, but he's dead. Okay, so uh, next question, which you've kind of already touched on, I guess, but let, let's uh, ask a question directly. Do you, th I'm mainly talking it for the next couple of questions about the reaction from government, uh, authority figures, whatever, and then we're going to get to the reaction from the general, from the general public. So it's, Looking at the government reaction, uh, particularly what we've heard the last few days here in the U.S., do you think the reaction to the threat is overblown? Do you think it's not strong enough, or do you think it's about right? It's underblown. In other words, <clears throat> if the government was competent and acting, we'd have been locked down, all of us, several months ago. Uh, and we still are people, are, I think the government is afraid of, the people in the government who know the truth have been trying to tell it. Uh, Tony Fauci and so on have gently been saying it's going to get much worse. Uh, and that's what all the curves show at the moment to any scientist. Um, but uh, certainly the U.S., and I have to say, some of the governors, some of the local areas, the government has been excellent. And once got the information, has been trying to do exactly the things that should have been done. Uh, but the, you, the incompetence of the government can be seen simply if try and go out. I don't know when this is going to be broadcast, but try and go out and get yourself tested if you have to. Uh, the first thing you have to do in dealing with a pandemic is identify who's got it. Uh, and we can't do that yet. So incompetent uh, and way, way underblown in its reaction. Well, okay, I think I already, when you know the answer to a question, it's not really a question, but since it's written down in front of me, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and ask it, and you can probably say go on to question six. I've already mentioned this, but anyway, 
probably the longest question I have is, is talking about the debate over civil rights. Do you believe the threat of coronavirus trumps our, I hate to use that word, trumps uh, our civil rights? Should the government be given uh, the power to curtail basic freedoms such as freedom of assembly, freedom of movement, and the pursuit of happiness in order to respond to the level of threat from coronavirus, or should this be left to individual choice to decide how you want to respond to this level of threat in your own life? The answer is very simple. The whole reason we have governments is to do things that we can't successfully do individually. Therefore, there's no way uh, that I can personally guarantee that people are following the rules that are necessary to avoid my death and the death of many other people. Therefore, in these circumstances, it's just like a war. That is, uh, we wish we could avoid wars, but we get them. Uh, and we wish we could avoid pandemics, but we get them. And that's when government has to come in. You can have rules that say uh, that any malfeasance by the government when the emergency is over, those people who do not perform properly will be punished. But this is clearly, it's just like uh, the 13 colonies had to get together to solve the problem of dealing with the British. Uh, the whatever number of nations we now have have to get together to settle with it. I'm getting a robo call. I'm sure you are. I can't believe that we've gone 16 minutes without yeah. both of us uh, getting six of them. <laughs> But I mean, the, the point is, this is what, what governments are for, and um, uh, there's no question, this is, this, like the climate thing, has to be solved, not just by local governments and federal governments, but by the world's governments. This is an international problem, uh, and it's one that should be solved on an international scale. It's one we should have been working on years ago. I mean, to give an example and put some blame somewhere else, the Chinese have a duck, pond, pig, uh, wildlife market system for generating lethal viruses, which is what has happened this time. We, the internationally, we should have done things to help China get rid of that uh, virus factory. Uh, and they're starting to, but it's much too late. And we've known for decades that what should have been done. Okay. Can you, can I get you to back up just a little bit again, Paul, as your, your, your face, your chin is getting oh, kind of, sorry. there, there, there you go, back up. there, there you go, there, there's that, there, there's that, good lady. man, if, if I look as good as you, Paul, at uh, going on to 88, you already look a lot better than I do at age 60. <laughs> anyway, three more questions here. Uh, I want to turn from the government to the general public. Uh, do you think the reaction that we're seeing to the coronavirus, and of course I'm, sp I'm mostly talking here about all of the panic buying and the hoarding, and now I'm even hearing about ramping up gun sales, do you think that this is a good snapshot into the future of collapse? Is this what we can expect to see a lot more of as more of these things appear uh, uh, in the next few years? I, I think we can see a lot more of it. I think the general public is not stupid. They don't trust the government. In other words, in the current situation, we see the government completely bundling everything, the federal government, uh, and therefore people are doing what seems wise to them uh, because there are no system set up to make sure that the food flows continue, that the water uh, system continues to work, that the uh, electrical grid stays up and isn't get hacked and so on. So the people are smart. Uh, they're smart. Unhappily in our society, they're uneducated. I mean, for example, uh, the universities have totally given up trying to do anything decent in the world and have just become places that generate uh, and new parts for the machine, keep oiling the machine parts uh, without figuring out where the engine is actually going. <laughs> uh, think about it, during the Vietnam War, which was a total fake disaster, I mean, it was a disaster, but uh, based on fake news, 
and the wants of our industrial complex, uh, where there was a lot of ferment on the universities and university presidents were intellectual uh, leaders. Uh, and now the universities do nothing. They're only interested in money uh, and the students are trained to be interested in money and they're doing nothing at all to lead society. It's a, a, in my own lifetime, a huge change in what's going on in universities. Uh, okay, uh, we got two, two more. Uh, number seven, do you think that bigger threats than coronavirus are on the near-term horizon? Yes, I think the, uh, the biggest threat that's on the near-term horizon is a combination of climate disruption and loss of biodiversity. We're wrecking our life support systems and we're already seeing impacts of that around the world in various ways, uh, ranging from the uh, new fire regimes in North America, <clears throat> Australia and elsewhere, uh, to uh, problems with agriculture based on uh, loss of pollination and so on. So I think that's going to get worse much, much more rapidly because, uh, for example, uh, and nobody knows the exact numbers, about half of wildlife have disappeared in the last 40 years. And the things we're doing to get rid of them until the uh, coronavirus have been, es uh, have been escalating at a rapid rate and uh, basically exponentially, which means the next couple of decades are going to be horrendous. Okay, which, which is an excellent segue into my final question. Uh, now, some people claim that global industrial civilization uh, is the single biggest threat to every other species of earthling we share the planet with. It's the single biggest threat to biodiversity. So if you, up to now, we've been talking about humans about how the coronavirus is affecting our health and our economy and our way of life in society. If you are not a human, if you were one of these butterflies that you uh, used to study or still study, do you think you would have a different opinion of coronavirus? Do you think there is something somewhere, a, a, a silver lining in this cloud for the rest of the earthlings we share this planet with. Uh, yeah, if I were a wild animal of any kind, I would look at the coronavirus as one of my heroes. Uh, because of course, uh, it has at least the potential for reducing somewhat the vast overpopulation <laughs> of Homo sapiens. However, as a Homo sapiens, <laughs> I'd rather we be sensible uh, and uh, start gradually reducing the size of our population, rapidly reducing our amount of consumption, and trying to build a sustainable human society and species that could coexist uh, with our life support systems. Uh, if we uh, wreck our life support systems, that'll be the end of it. So uh, if, I were, if I were a marmot uh, or a uh, rhino rhinoceros, I'd be a great fan of the coronavirus. Well, Paul Ehrlich, let's certainly hope that uh, M Mother Nature bringing out her broom does not, does not start sweeping right there in your building because uh, we really, really appreciate you taking this time out of your busy schedule. I know you have got to be slammed this week. And most of all, brother, we really appreciate your lifetime of working for the fighting the good fight and working for the good cause and all i can say is whatever happens keep up the good fight paul ehrlich thank you very much it's been my pleasure and rather than keeping up the fight i'm going to drink a lot of wine there you go so guys if you enjoyed this uh interview with paul ehrlich please spend a few seconds to thumb it up and by all means subscribe to collapse chronicles and we're going to have a lot more of these interviews where this came from. Bye, guys.